Marian Tuski is a Polish journalist and historian, and one of the last living survivors of the Holocaust. For several years he lived in the ghetto of Lodz. From there he was deported to Auschwitz, and later to Buchenwald. After surviving the gruelling death marches, he was finally liberated at Dresdenstadt in 1945. Tuski decided to stay in post-war communist Poland. As editor and journalist for the weekly Politica, he worked towards reconciliation between the various communities. Last January, during the commemoration at Auschwitz, Tuski gave a powerful speech that made headlines across the globe. Good morning, my Dutch friends. Not only my Dutch friends, but mainly my Dutch friends. My name is Marian Turski. I live in Warsaw, Poland. And English is not my native language. So do please forgive me my errors, my mistakes, which I will probably have while lecturing today. And maybe one explanation more. I'm a survivor of Auschwitz. Prior to it, I was sent to it because of my Jewish origin. Prior to it, I spent more than four and a half years in the ghetto of which second largest Jewish population in pure Poland. So, in a way, I am a witness of history. By education, I'm a historian. This is my profession, this is my education, this is my job. And I can understand that Rob Riemann, the boss of the Nexus Institute in Amsterdam, invited me to give this lecture in order not only to present you, I would say, an academic point of view, an academic research, but also to combine academic research with eyewitness experience. Thank you, Bob Riemann. And now to the point. The topic is what did the victims, that means the Jews, what did the Jews know about their fate? And, precisely, as well, what did I know, being a boy, and then after some years, what did I know about my fate? Well, I can understand, and I, and I can guess, that some of you who are listening to my lecture would be maybe even amazed and they would oppose. They would say, hey, Mr. Tursky, what are you saying? You knew everything. You knew everything. Hitler was not hiding his ideas, his approach to the Jews. Hitler was a full anti-Semite. And not only, he also used anti-Semitism as a tool in gaining power, in gaining, yes, this is true, the souls, the hearts, the support of people of the state. And he announced it. His pronunciation were public since the twenties. Everybody knew. Mein Kampf, his autobiography, 
published in millions, in millions of copies, was a kind of a Bible of Nazism. And in this Bible, you can find his approach to the Jews. So what are you saying? Wait, wait. You are right, but only to some extent. I'll give you in a while some evidence that pre in times before the war, even the Germans themselves did not know exactly what would be the fate of the Jews. In this meaning, that they didn't even guess a, per a particular moment when when there would come a sudden and violent way okay, of annihilating the Jews. And here's my evidence, here's my proof for it. Probably most of you know the famous event of what is known in German as the Kristallnacht. In English it means the night of the broken glasses. It happened November the 9th, 1938. It was in a way a landmark, a milestone in German and Nazi policy vis-à-vis -vis the Jews. The 9th and the 10th November 1938, there were, for the first time in this scale, a pogrom, a total attack on Jewish businesses, Jewish homes, Jewish uh, synagogues, uh, almost all the Jewish synagogues were burned down, almost all of them. Uh, 91 Jews were killed, at least 91. Then the, the, the shops were looted. Uh, it was absolutely a night of broken glasses. One of those who was the implementer of it and who in the future would become one of the executors of the so-called final solution of the Jews, his name was Reinhard Heydrich, who was very close to the narrow circle of, the, of those people who decided upon German poli policy, politics, uh, Hitler, and then Goering, Himmler, Goebbels, Bormann, maybe some others, but those, this was the narrow circle of the deciding people, and Heidrich was very close to them. He was a favorite student, a favorite supporter, a favorite son, I would say, pupil of Hitler. In a very short time he would become probably a member of this narrow circle who ruled Nazi Germany. Imagine that this Heidrich, a day or two days after Kristallnacht, wrote in an internal memo, we have it in the archives, and I'm quoting it. The process of getting rid of the Jews will take 10 years. End of the quotation. If that had been the case, it would have been not before 1948. But it happened something else.
Well, you see, he, in his imagination, it would take 10 years to get rid of the Jews. I'm calling him to get rid. What did they mean? What did they had in mind, have in mind while using the word to get rid? The Nazis don't deserve to be excused, but as a historian, I must look into the sources objective, objectively, and to be very close to the historical truth. In those days, it meant if the Jews, it meant depriving the Jews their citizens' right. The, the depriving the Jews, taking them away their civil rights, taking away their property. If they only agree to leave their property, their businesses in Germany, and if they want to emigrate, okay, why not? We want to have Germany Judenfrei. This was the idea of getting rid of the Jews in those days. Well, so it would something happen special. It would afterwards what will change their policy, their approach to Jews, and not only to Jews. And I'm coming to the title. So if you ask me what the victims did know about their fate, first of all, we should fix when it was decided by the Germans themselves. So we have, first of all, to determine when the fate was decided, when, and more precisely, when the fate, when it was decided to speed up that fate, to accelerate, to sudden, violent, immediate extermination. You will find in very many books, also in some textbooks still, and in such a great source of information as is the Wikipedia, Wikipedia, that this was decided in Wannsee, the famous conference in Wannsee in 1942. It is this information is misleading. I'll tell you why. Not only because the participants of this conference, which took place January the 20th, 1942, were not the, high, the highest rank dignitaries, German dignitaries. Only Heydrich, who was presiding the conference, he was really one of the top, from the top. Maybe closest to was the boss of uh, Gestapo, Heinrich Müller, and then rather important dignitaries, but third rank, fourth rank, vice ministers, deputies of the different ministers. They were not able to make the real decisions. Second point. Look, the Basel Conference convened exactly January the 20th, 1942. And since December the 8th, 1941, the first gassing in Chomno 
the German Kulmhof was implemented. The first gathering of gypsies and Jews from so-called Vertigo. And we should have a little bit of imagination. You cannot just have an object ready in one day. Probably it took them at least a month to prepare the place, to prepare the transport to it, and so on, so on, so on. So, no doubt that the decision was made at least before November, maybe before October 42. Yes, one thing was important, very important, because it worked out the logistic of the so-called final solution of the extermination of the Jews. How many transports, how many cars you need, uh, what would be the schedule, who would be responsible for the logistic, and so on, and so on, and so on, so on, so on. But it was only something to work out, a decision which was the verdict which was passed at least several months earlier, prior to it. When? There is no doubt that the so-called Barbarossa plan, the offensive, Hitler's offensive of Russia, against Russia, and this very cruel war, that this was a change and then combined afterwards with the Pearl Harbor and the war with the, um, with the United States, this was a new milestone. This was a real milestone, the landmark in German policy. Let me quote something very important, very interesting. A week before the offensive against Russia started, one of the most important personalities of Nazi Germany, Joseph Goebbels, was invited by Hitler, and this is what he wrote, what he put it down in his diary. I'm quoting. It is the entry from his diary, dates June the 15, 1941. The most powerful offensive the world has ever seen. He's predicting what will happen in one week. Napoleon's story has no ground to be repeated. The Führer estimates that the world campaign will not last longer than four months. I personally estimate that it will take us less. We are a step away from a triumph. The pact with Russia really was a stain on our honor. The Führer says that whether or not the right is on our side, we must win. There is no other way for us. What we plan is in every way proper, moral, and necessary. And when we have won, who is going to ask us how we did it? End of quotation. And now another quotation. I don't want to overload you with quotation, but still it is part of my job because those are the sources. Several weeks later, when the offensive is developing more and more, and also they started killing the communists, the Jews, the apparatchikists, and so on, so on, by special units called the Einsatzgruppen. 
here you have this following entry from Goebbels' diary. I'm quoting. It is a life and death struggle between the Aryan race and the Jewish bacillus. Another government, another ruler, would have lacked the courage to address this question and solve it once and for all. The Führer has shown himself to be the undaunted pioneer and spokesman for a radical solution, and that is precisely what the present situation demands. Praise God, there is a war and we can reach for means that we could not apply in peacetime. We must use them to the full. End of the quotation. Well, I think this is, it depicts the change of their own attitude, of their own, of the Nazis' own attitude. And not by incidence, from the same times, I can quote also something important, the authorization of second man in Germany of Hermann Göring given to Heydrich. I direct, I am quoting, I direct you to make all necessary organizational, logistical and material preparation for total solution of the Jewish question in German zone of influence in Europe. I direct you to submit to me shortly an exhaustive plan of organizational, logistical and material preparations preceding the achievement of the desired final solution of the Jewish question." End of quotation. This was really a kind of, he entitled, Göring entitled Heidrich to convene the Wannsee Conference to look for means, for ways, how to work out the final solution. And here are the result of the first year. In 1941, after the beginning of the Hitler's offensive, which was June, end of June, the 41, Till the end of 41, 600,000 Jews were murdered in a normal way, by shooting, by executions, in the Baltic states, in the former eastern territories of pre-war Poland, in, in, the Bel in Belarus, in the Ukraine, and probably you know spe special names of executions. It was Padirai Ponari near Vilnius, Lithuania, Four Nine in Kaunas, Lithuania, it was Rumbula in Latvia, it was Babinyar in the Ukraine. And here arises the question, what we did know about this change, about this acceleration to a rapid, to a immediate, immediate stage phase of killing, of murder. The news about Ponar were the first which reached Polish Jews. And I will try to have a glimpse into three circles, three great Jewish populations. First, around Vilnius, Second, the largest population of Warsaw, and finally, I'll come to my town, to Łódź, 
where I lived and what I experienced. There were rumors about Padirai, about Ponari, and thanks to the cooperation, even dated from before the war, between the Jewish pioneers, scouts, Jewish scouts g gathered mm, in the in the, in the organization Hashomer Hatzair with the scout organization, a clandestine scout organization, a Polish scout organization headed by a wonderful uh, gentleman, a great hero, Alexander Kaminski. They use the nickname uh, the Grey Ranks in Polish Szare Szereg. There was a cooperation, and because the Jews were not permitted to travel, the people, the wonderful guys from the Polish scout organization, sent dedicated people like Irena Adamowicz, Henry Grabowski, to those areas, and they brought the report to deliver them to the Jewish leaders. One of the leaders was, you probably know the name because he was very famous, he became very famous, Yitzhak Zuckerman Antek. And in November 1941, when the scout, the Polish scout Grabowski reached him and reported him what happened in his native town Vilnius, he was absolutely shocked. He was absolutely shocked and in his memoirs he confessed, by the way if you will have a chance to read them, they were published also in English under the title um, Surplus of Memory. I'm quoting, it was a great blow. That was not just a pogrom. The knowledge that ponari, ponari means death knocked me off my feet. And this is significant that this milieu, this circle of Jewish leaders in the area of Vilnius, of Lithuania, which was before the war, Polish territory, that they, they first realized what happened. Their leader, a great personality, a great, absolutely, uh, a poet, a fighter, may be some of you know his name, Abba Kovner, he gathered the main active of the young Jewish fighters in this area of Vilnius and the night of December 31, 1941, he declared publicly to them. It was a clandestine meeting and he declared, and this is what he told them. Friends, comrades, colleagues, we are the witness of a new stage of German policy with respect to Jews. It is the stage of immediate extermination. End of the quotation. At this moment, we can say, we can state that the leaders of, Vilna, of Vilnius Jews in the end of 1941 realized that this is a new stage in German policy, that it means immediate annihilation. How was it in Warsaw? Rumors about Kaunas, about Vilnius, about some other places 
reached the Warsaw Ghetto in the first months of 42. But my dear friends, you should understand that maybe I will repeat it twice or three times. People don't want to believe that something at most wrong could happen to them. People still believe maybe it was only an incident in this place, maybe something, it was a revenge in this place, maybe it was a special cruel a Nazi commander, but they could not comprehend, they could not embrace in their mind that a full nation could be a goal of extermination. My very good friend, who also a survivor of Auschwitz, maybe you know her name, Halina Birnbaum, a poet, she lives in Israel, she wrote her autobiography and she titled it The Hope Dies the Last. This is true. People, so long they live, they, they have some hope. And therefore it was so, it was so difficult, so hard to understand it, to comprehend it. But there were two facts which had to disturb this routine, this way, this, this way of thinking. First, when Zuckerman arrived to the Warsaw Ghetto with the news, and the news were delivered by the scouts, and second, very important, as probably you know, the first gassing started, as I mentioned before, in Helmno, which was German Kulmhof. It is a long story. I will tell it in brief. A young Jewish boy, whom we know as maybe Feiner, maybe Wiener, rather Wiener, who afterwards would uh, obtain a nickname, a uh, Groinowski, in order to hide himself uh, uh, while to find a shelter uh, because he was chased by the Germans, was forced to be one of those who buried the Jews being prior to it, gassed in Kulmpo. This was the first gassing, the first, um, the, the first extermination camp uh, which was uh, established. Kulmpo, Helmno. He escaped. This is a long story how he escaped. This is a film, this is a movie, but I don't have time now to tell about it. Then he found for one day a shelter in a nearby 20 kilometers away from the camp in a little town, Grabov. He was looking for the local chief rabbi, rabbi. It was a rabbi, Yaakov Schulman. He told him the story and what happened, escaped further on because he was chased by the Germans and found a place, a way to come to the Warsaw Ghetto. And after he came to Warsaw Ghetto, he was in touch with the clandestine archive in the Warsaw Ghetto. Maybe you have heard about it. There was a group headed by Dr. Emanuel Ringelblum, a wonderful historian, and they established a clandestine archive in the Warsaw Ghetto 
now because it survived, it was preserved, uh, not fully, more or less 65 percent. Now it is on the list of the great treasures of mankind, of the list of UNESCO. And people from this clandestine archive took an interview with this Schlamek Wiener. We have it in our archive, still it is in Warsaw. When you come, you can see it. And he gave the first testimony how the gassing in a extermination camp takes, pla takes place. Uh, so what he reported was afterwards published in the clandestine, in the underground press in Warsaw. So you see two ways. One way, the news from Vilnius delivered by the Polish scouts and Yitzhak Zuckerman. On the other way, the testimony of the escapee from the extermination camp of Kulmhof, it could change the idea of the Jews. It could, well, in a way, I would say, yes, since this testimony it was already known in Warsaw Ghetto what, would, what is happening to Jews. But am I not exaggerating? What does it mean it was known? Who knew it? It knew only the elite. Dear friends, how can you can you imagine how many copies in how many copies were distribution was distributed a clandestine newspaper, two hundred, three hundred, five hundred, maybe even thousand people, people were reading it, some were shocked, but in general they did still did not believe maybe it happened elsewhere, but with a great population of 350,000 or 400,000 Jews, would they do the same? Impossible. Impossible. This was the way of thinking in Europe in those days. And therefore, I tell you, if somebody knew it, it only knew the elite. And still, between even some people knew about it, it was not before July 42 when really the Warsaw ghetto population realized that this is a new stage in German policy vis-à-vis -vis the Jews. The 22nd of July, 1942, began the so-called, we know it from textbooks, the Great Deportation from Warsaw. In two months, almost 300,000 Jews were deported to Treblinka and were gassed in Treblinka. When the leaders of the Jewish organization understood, realized that this is beginning of the liquidation of the ghetto and of the population of the ghetto. You probably have seen the film Pianist of Polanski. So you can imagine how it looked in those days in Warsaw. So the next day, all the leaders of the parties convened, gathered together, and were discussing what we have to do. The young leaders, among them 
Zuckerman demanded, we shall go out onto the streets, we the leaders, we the leaders of the political parties, and tell the Jews, now you, the, the whole population will be killed, will be murdered. We should start the resistance against the Germans and because our fate is absolutely, our verdict, the verdict is passed on our, of, on our fate, we should resist with an axe, with a knife, what with everything possible. I remember those words, the words of Zuckerman. I want to see the blood on Warsaw streets before it would be the blood in Treblinka. And it is very important to understand the most absolutely decent people, decent, decent leaders of the Jewish community, well-known leaders, modest, with great merits, I will name them by name. It was the leader of the religious party, Rabbi Zisha Friedman. He was one of those who opposed the young leaders, I'm quoting, the Lord God will not allow, allow the killing of the world society. If we go onto the streets, everyone will die. End of quotation. Another great leader, Zionist leader, Professor Schripper, Yitzhak Schripper, said, responding to the appeal of Zuckerman of the young people, I'm quoting, listen, War requires sacrifice. Maybe 50,000 will die, or even 80,000, but the rest will be left. If we go out onto the streets as you want, they'll kill everyone. End of the quotation. So, my dear friends, how to evaluate, how to appreciate this kind of thinking, you cannot abstract that you have a town with families, Jewish families, and those people, those leaders responsible for those families, they didn't dare to appeal to start what they were sure would end with a mass killing. Sometimes it's hard to understand, but there's a way to understand the responsibility of those people who had the old people and the kids and the families to go with no arms against the Germans, does it make sense? Maybe, and still nobody could imagine that there could be a plan of a total annihilation of the Jewish nation. But, no doubt, that this was the real, after the deportations, this was the main stimulus for those who left alive. Not very many, some between 40, 50, 55,000, maybe 60,000, who prepared the uprising and which and we, we know we are proud of it. We are really, this is sometimes we call it the second Masada. 
But no doubt that after the Great Deportation, when they realized that there is no other way, they decided to make the uprising. And also because they were not, not more old people who were murdered, not young kids they were murdered, single young people, desperate people could afford an uprising. So here we come lastly to my ghetto, to the ghetto of Wuj. The deportations from the Wuj ghetto started in January 1942. And this is significant. Till May, they were deported 55,000 out of the 160,000 of the population of the Wood Ghetto. People, of course, were shocked. But, and he also, please do understand our way of thinking at the time. There were total families deported. First of all, those who came from abroad, from Germany, from Austria, from Vienna, from Prague, from Luxembourg, and then, and then local people. But in the beginning, because the Germans deceived people, they betrayed people, they were mm, telling them, you, are, you will go to a new large ghetto where you will get more food than you get it in the woods. And what was absolutely, absolutely mostly touching the population in the woods, starvation, hunger. Listen, I will give you a quotation from a famous uh, Czech Jewish writer who was in Warsaw in the Woods Ghetto, Oscar Singer. He wrote his diary, his memoirs. He didn't survive, by the way. And he admitted, he confessed, and I'm quoting, some, above all Jews from the Old Reich and Vienna, accept the blow with their own kind of calm. Many say, it can't be worse than in the ghetto. Hunger outside the ghetto can't be greater. And that is the most important after all. A significant proportion of the Jews sign up of their own accord. They want to take advantage of the opportunity to leave the ghetto. And this is the mentality of people who know that if they will stay alive, they will die due to hunger, due to exhaustion, due to TBC. So if they go, maybe it will be better. There was something in addition. In the beginning, where there was the beginning of the ghetto in 1940, really, the Germans recruited some labor people, labor, young people, to go to the west, the western part of Poland, it was the eastern part of the Altreich, to build auto routes, to build highways, and it was a very, a very uh, decimating people job, but they, some, very many uh, died, but some of them returned and told, yes, it was absolutely unbelievable hard work, but we got more food than we, used to, than we were used to it in the Wood Ghetto. From this point of view, some people believe maybe this is also something to new jobs. They have new territories in the East. Maybe they will take us to work there and they will feed us better because worse than it is here in the ghetto of which cannot be. And so this at first at first 
signal of that it happened something in the atmosphere wrong took place in May. Why? In May 17th, a little community of the little ghetto, not far from which, 20 kilometers from which, Pabianice ghetto, was joined, was moved from Pabianice to Wuj. And they told us a story that in their ghetto was a great, a huge laundry. In this laundry, where, to this laundry were sent the clothes to be cleaned, and they found the people in the ghetto in Pabianice, they found in the pockets money from which ghetto? What, does, what did it mean? What does it mean? Imagine that the Wood Ghetto issued its own currency. Well, it was a fake currency, just to take away the, the good money from the Jews, but it's another story. But when they found it, they understood that the clothes come from people who were sent in deported to Helmino, to Kulmhof. This was the first signal that we understood where the, the, the people deported went to. A second ominous signal was in July, the same year, when the commander, the commandant of the death camp in Helmdorf, in Kulmhof, sent a letter to the Wuj ghetto asking whether in this, in my ghetto, could be produced a mill, a mill to grain bones. This, this was something absolutely horrible. But who knew about it? Only those who were close to the letter, those there were some rumors, but people still didn't believe a meal to gain bones. Is it? This is so inhuman. People can't, couldn't believe in such inhuman possibilities. And then it was one month, even maybe two months, because the deportation stopped in May, and then June and July, even August, were respectively calm, even more. There was even more food in the ghetto. Why? Now we know. Because 55,000 people were kicked out, were, went away from the ghetto, and there was some little bit more food in the ghetto, additional food for those who still were living in the ghetto. And a new blow, and maybe the last one to understand what is our fate, reached us in the beginning of September. In the beginning of September, September the 1st, suddenly, the Germans uh, went into all the hospitals in the ghetto, took all the people, put them on trucks, and deported from the ghetto. Four days later, it was announced in German, it calls Eine uh, Gesperre, which means a curfew. And the Elder, the elder of the Jews, this so-called, sometimes he's called the king of the Jews, Rumkowski, had a speech, as he used to doing it, at the a square in front of the fireman quarter, barracks, and I'm going now to quote this, his speech. At least 
part of it, because it is really I'm out of time. The ghetto has been struck a hard blow. They demand what is most dear to it, children and old people. In my old age, I am forced to stretch out my hands and to beg. Brothers and sisters, give them to me. Fathers and mothers, give me your children. Yesterday, in the course of the day, I was given the order to send away more than 20,000 Jews from the ghetto. And if I did not, they said, we will do it ourselves. Guided not by the thought how many will be lost, but how many can be saved, I arrived at the conclusion that however difficult it was going to be, I must carry out this difficult and bloody operation. I must cut off limbs in order to save the body. I have come like a robber to take from you what is dearest to your heart. I tried everything I knew to get the bitter sentence cancelled. I succeeded in one thing, to save the children over ten. Let that be our consolation and our great sorrow. There are many people in this ghetto who suffer from tuberculosis, whose day or perhaps weeks are numbered. I do not know, perhaps this is a satanic plan. But I cannot stop myself from proposing, give me these sick people and perhaps it will be possible to save the healthy in their place. I know how precious each one of the sick is in his home, and particular, in particularly among Jews. But at a time of such decrease, one must weigh up and measure who should be saved, who can be saved, and who may be saved. I don't want to comment it. This is so moving, so touching, so horrible. It is sometimes like, like reading Shakespeare. Yes, there's something of Shakespearean spirit, mood, climate. And I've, I don't doubt that if there would be a collection of the greatest speeches in history of mankind, this speech should be enclosed. My dear friends, now after September 5th, everybody in the ghetto of which we realized that this was the new stage, the new policy, that our fate, the, the, the verdict was passed. Thank you.